Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is Q&A number 19. As always, if you have any questions that you want me to answer on the podcast, you can send them to me on michael at scientifictriathlon.com and that's Michael with a K or send them on Facebook through the widget in the bottom right corner on scientifictriathlon.com. Before we get into today's question, big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Retool. Retool is a bike fitting system that uh, makes riding more comfortable, reduces the risk of injury from cycling, and uh, it makes you ride faster. And all of these combined to make it that much more enjoyable. And as I talked about before, I trust Retool when it comes to my bike fits on both the road and the triathlon bike that I use, uh, that I train and race on. And uh, I am very, very happy with the results uh, because I am comfortable on both my bikes. I can produce power in both positions. And now that I've had a lot of time to uh, to get used to riding on my Ventum, my new triathlon bike, and get used to the fit, I can definitely confirm that I am very aerodynamic on it and I'm excited to see uh, what I'll do in my non-draft races this year that I actually have a triathlon bike and not just a road bike with clip-on aero bars. So all of those factors are of course super important and you can't have uh, one but not the others. You need all of them to be able to perform at your best in races and in training. And with the Retool bike fitting system, you can have all of them. It is so adaptable to the individual and that's what you'll find out when you go and get your Retool bike fit. So to do that, to schedule an appointment with uh, your nearest Retool bike fitter, uh, go to retool.com forward slash TTS to learn more. And Retool is spelled R-E-T-U-L. So it's retool.com forward slash TTS. And a big thanks to Hit Science. Hit Science is a, the course on high intensity interval training by Paul Larson, who is a repeat guest on the show, and his colleague Martin Boucher. Uh, enrollment closes today if you hear this episode when it comes out on January 31st of 2019. So I repeat, this is the last day that you can sign up for who knows how long. If you are a coach, a sports scientist or a sports science student or even an athlete that are ambitious and want to take your training to the next level and make sure that you train to the best of your ability, uh, then the HIT science course is for you. Uh, for me as a coach, is uh, invaluable as well as, as an athlete and uh, myself, of course. But really as a coach, I think is where I will get the most benefit from it and it will definitely be something that uh, that takes my elevates my coaching to another level when I can be really specific and know that much more about high-intensity interval training compared to what I knew before. This week's module is the physiological basis of high-intensity interval training, and it is absolutely fundamental uh, for understanding the different types of training and the different physiological responses to different types of HIIT intervals. Uh, and uh, these responses, of course, lead to different adaptations and therefore different performance improvements. So these are all things that we need to consider when we solve the programming puzzle if we want to make that program to be the ideal for any given athlete with consideration of their context, their goal, races, and so on. You can read more about the course on scientifictriathlon.com forward slash H-I-I-T, and that's where you can enroll as well. Uh, the course has a full money-back guarantee, so it's a risk-free investment. Uh, go and check it out for sure. I 100% endorse it. It's uh, probably second only to starting this podcast, which has allowed me to connect with countless fantastic coaches like Paul Larson and pick their brains. But second to starting this podcast, uh, the Heat Science course is uh, probably the best coaching education resource I've ever gone through. Uh, so that is uh, very, very high marks in my book. All right, let's get to today's question, which comes from David Sparshot from the United Kingdom. He writes, Hi Michael, I have a question regarding race fueling that I hope you'll uh, be able to consider for one of your excellent Q&A podcasts. I am a competent runner and a triathlete with a marathon PB of 2.45, and I completed my first and only Olympic distance triathlon thus far in just over two hours. This year, I am running the London Marathon and have signed up for my first 7.3 in September. 
I follow a fairly sensible LCHF diet, eating healthily without any refined sugars and grains. I always do my Sunday morning long ride, run or bike fasted and comfortably go three hours without the need for anything other than water. I usually eat some dried fruit prior to more intense workouts, but never gels or bars. For reference, I find the nutritional philosophy of Tim Noakes and Barry Murray, amongst others, compelling. The typical nutritional advice of 60 grams per hour for the duration of a race, to me, seems crazy. I would typically take a gel at 70, 110 and 150 minutes during a marathon race. My question is, does taking on board carbs during a race reduce the body's fat burning ability? Uh, the question goes on, but let's stop here and address some of these points first. So I won't go too deep down the rabbit hole of discussing different labeled diets here. Uh, of course, it's uh, up to you, David, how you eat. Uh, but uh, at least for other listeners' information, I want to make sure that you're aware that there are no links between having an LCHF diet or any diet for that matter and improved endurance performance. And anecdotally speaking, I don't know anybody in uh, any professional triathlete, whether it's on short course or long course, like let's say like the top 10 in the world, short course or long course athletes. I, I think that uh, zero or one, that's uh, that's the amount of athletes that would, would follow anything like that. But uh, none of these athletes, these the best athletes in the world, they, they do not think of what they eat in terms of diets they they don't think of it in terms of reducing or minimizing any particular macronutrient so so i don't really think it makes sense and they are the best in the world so so i, th I think it, uh, uh, it it goes to show something that's not really in my opinion the right way to go i i don't think that cutting out or reducing any given mac macronutrient whether it's fat carbs or protein that doesn't make sense uh, but to get more of a deep dive into this, go and listen to episode 153 on this podcast, which is The Endurance Diet with Matt Fitzgerald. And uh, I can give a personal example. Uh, I don't follow any labeled diet. I just eat uh, very healthy most of the time, but not all the time. I, For example, yesterday was uh, uh, a coffee ride where I had uh, a pastry in the middle of the ride, and I'm totally fine with that. Uh, but still, my maximum fat oxidation rate is uh, 0 0.88 grams per minute, which is, uh, for reference, very, very good uh, for an age group athlete. And uh, this comes, as we'll get into, from uh, a sensible, healthy diet, but more so. Like, most of the fat oxidation gains that you'll make comes from actually training, and not so much from, uh, from any uh, detailed changes you make to your diet. Uh, so that's uh, that's important to realize that it's it's more a training effect in how you change your fat oxidation rather than uh, a nutrition effect. Although nutrition does play a part, yes, but it's a much smaller part than what the part that training actually makes. And you mentioned a couple of proponents of LCHF, and it is true that they are out there. Uh, but it, what what I found is that if you ask one hundred scientists or ex expert sports nutritionists, the best of them out there. At least, it's the same discussion here as with the elite athletes, but at least 95 of these 100 will say that you should not focus on cutting out or reducing uh, the intake of any given macronutrient. You could have like a periodized intake that you, for example, do uh, a couple of weeks where you go like lower carb and use that as sort of like a nutrition uh, crash course, a crash training course or whatever you want to call it. But over the long haul, uh, that's something that at least 95 out of 100 world-class scientists and expert sports nutritionists will tell you that it does not make any sense to do that. There is no evidence that it will help you in any given in any, any way. Uh, but to answer your question then, uh, as for whether taking on onboard carbs during a race reduces your body's ability to burn fat, uh, no. Uh, I am 95. I have. I have to say. I haven't found anything that specifically says that it does or does not, but uh, just based on uh, normal exercise metabolism knowledge that we'll go into a bit more later on, uh, and uh, normal knowledge of physiology, I am 97% confident that the answer is no. Uh, maybe you have like a spike one minute after taking on a gel or something like that, but but in the big picture, it does not at all change your fat oxidation rate if you take on 
carbs or not. And because fat oxidation, it depends on your intensity and your relative intensity, I should say. So, so what's your percentage of VO2 max is the way that is typically measured. Uh, so, so what might happen actually is that uh, you take on a gel and uh, suddenly you start to go faster because you get some uh, quick and efficient fuel into your muscles and perhaps you're running low if you're uh, you're way into your race already. Uh, but regardless, even if it's, if you're at the start of the race, that gel might give uh, your brain a boost. And we know that, uh, that taking on sugar, that can uh, reduce the perceived effort for the brain so it's more of a, a mental aspect than a than a meta- me- metabolic aspect and so potentially you start to go quicker and then as, as you go quicker your intensity your relative intensity becomes of course higher than it was and then yes because you increase that relative intensity your fat oxidation might increase and your carb oxidation uh, sorry your fat oxidation decreases and your carb oxidation increases because the closer you get to VO2 max, the the less uh, fat. Not it's it's not that at zero intensity you burn 100% fat or anything like that. Actually, your maximum fat oxidation is usually somewhere around, let's say, 60% of of VO2 max, somewhere around that mark. And you can consider like your Olympic distance race intensity is perhaps 80% of VO2 max. Uh, so, but from that, let's say that you are doing. Uh, doing a 60% race, so like a long endurance cycling event or something, you go at 60% and then you take on a gel and you start to go at 65 or 70%, maybe 70% to make sure that we have a bit of a difference. We, we are past that maximum fat oxidation stage. That's where, yes, your fat oxidation will be reduced and your carb oxidation will be increased. Your overall energy production will, of course, be increased because you're going at a higher intensity. Uh, so so that's what might happen if you take on a gel if you start to go quicker but if you take on that gel and you keep the intensity the same then no you will burn the same amount of uh, of fat and carbs as you did uh, before but remember as well what the big uh, picture the big picture is like you're not looking to to burn the most amount of fat that's not the person that gets the medal or the the winner's trophy it's the person that crosses the finish line first so what you want to do is is to actually go as fast as possible so you want to produce as much energy as you possibly can and then of course waste as little of that energy as possible by going by being very economical and in cycling it that this doesn't really make a big difference but in running if you're more economical then that makes a, a massive difference compared to somebody who is less economical of course uh, but uh, but what you're looking at doing is to increase your your substrate utilization and your substrate utilization is both fat and carbs. So you should not focus so much on on the fat oxidation as as much as actually what's the maximum intensity that you can hold, and then fueling to make sure that you don't run out of fuel before you cross the finish line. That's how you'll be the fastest at the end of the day. So it's really simple. It's not something that. Uh, needs to be made uh, very complex really uh, but again uh, focus more on w- what the ma- what the end goal is it's to cross the finish line as quickly as as possible so uh, so how much energy you can metabolize in any given time period you want to maximize that and you want to fuel to allow you to to reach the finish finish line with that uh, metabolic rate which includes uh, oxidizing both fat and carbohydrate The second part of David's question, uh, I'll read on here verbatim. Uh, If uh, if so, and by this uh, David means if uh, taking on carbs reduces fat oxidation, if so, is there a sensible strategy when competing in longer distance races in keeping the body in a fat burning state, but still with enough readily available carb sources from gels, solids and drinks? In other words, will the body switch from fat to carb burning if carbs are introduced too early in a race, I have no experience of planning fueling for a 70.3 and the thought of eating gels for four hours is a bit nauseating. All right, so this is a big fallacy. There is no switch between fat and carb oxidation. You'll always be oxidizing both, and, uh, uh, the, and but the, the relative proportion of how much you, you oxidize of each will depend on uh, on the intensity. So, so for example, at your... 
uh, maximum fat oxidation intensity, which might be that 60% of VO2 max. Uh, perhaps you metabolize, uh, let's say, I'm just looking at some numbers here from my own data. It might be, it might be that you, you metabolize roughly twice the amount of fat as uh, carbohydrate. This is, in my example, at my fat, uh, at my roughly 60% VO2 max intensity. But uh, at your Olympic distance intensity, for example, if we assume that that's roughly 80% of VO2 max, then you might only, you might uh, oxidize four times more carbs than fat. And of course, there are individual variations here, but it's not like somebody who is on an LCHF diet just because you're doing that. It's not going to mean that you only uh, oxidize twice as much carbs than fat compared to four times as much carbs than fat at your 80% VO2 max. The, the changes are much smaller than that. And potentially, it's not even positive depending on your diet because training has that much a bigger impact than, than diet in, in your metabolism at the end of the day. Uh, so, but at any intensity, whether it's at that sixty percent VO two max or the eighty percent VO two max or something else, the body is always oxidizing both carbohydrate and fat, and uh, so, so it makes no sense to like uh, to to delay when you start taking on carbs in your race. Uh, it won't change how really how at any given intensity your metabolism of the different substrates. So again, it, it really comes uh, comes down to what I said earlier, that if, if you're taking the bike as an example here, because it's quite simple to understand, but the same applies for swimming and running. Of course, in swimming, it's <laughs> difficult to take on carbs. So, so maybe not so much to swimming, but, but to running at least. So, but if you're, you're on the bike, you want to, you, you want to get that bike done as quickly as possible. Of course, to leave you some, uh, some energy left for the run, but, but still, you want to be as fast as possible on the bike. So the way to do that is to, if we, aerodynamics is not a factor, you you have your given aerodynamic drag, and that's what we're working with. Uh, to be as fast as possible, you need to to produce as much power as possible, and to produce power, you need to produce energy. So you need to maximize your uh, your substrate utilization, and that includes both carbs and fats. And you need to you need to know based on that like how much carbs do you need to fuel with to make sure that you don't run out of glycogen because uh, well that is the the advantage of fat of course that it is abundant in the body uh, so we don't need to worry about running out of fat but with carbs we do so you need to fuel for that but of course you could go much slower than your ideal intensity and then you wouldn't have to worry about that because you could be going at that 60 percent vo2 max intensity and it would be no problem to not take on anything and you could hold that intensity easily and uh, yeah, there, there you go. But that would be a much slower way to complete your your race than to try to optimize the energy output, the power production, and then fuel accordingly. And that is why it's so important when it comes to long distance races to practice taking on energy uh, because it's not something that, uh, that you can immediately just switch on and, and be really good at it. It's something that you need to work on to become more effective at and to of course, if you feel that it's nauseating, then that's something that it also you need to gradually learn to do that. And it won't be nauseating once you're used to that. But it takes a lot of training, just like endurance sports in general, as you know, uh, being a very fast marathoner and, and a very fast triathlete already so early in your career. It, it takes a lot of time to you have spent hours and hours and hours and hours training endurance sports to get to this level. And with nutrition, it's uh, it's not the same thing. You don't need to train as much, but you do need to train it to be able to take on that energy. So so definitely taking on nutrition and training that is a very important part of the long-distance triathlon performance puzzle. If you really want to understand more about this and, and what you need to do, like how you should fuel, uh, what you're oxidizing in terms of your substrate substrate metabolism at different intensities, then I'd really encourage you to go and get a metabolic test done. And then you can see how much carb and fat you burn at any given intensity. And that will make it clear to you, you, you will see on the chart, there's no magic switch. And the key to racing fast is, is maximizing your intensity, not maximizing your fat oxidation, and then fuel for that intensity. 
and knowing that your training is what at the end of the day is going to be the biggest impact in terms of how you improve both your carb and your fat oxidation which will make you a faster endurance athlete at the end of the day so we don't need to make things overly complex here really but yeah i would encourage you to get a metabolic test done that is uh, very very useful now uh, this is uh, that's basically the end of the answer to the question but i do want to sort of uh, do an exercise metabolism 101 here and talk a bit more generally about this topic because it's so often greatly misunderstood and uh, there are a lot of uh, of things it, it the misunderstanding of these these topics it leads to all sorts of overly complex strategies that don't have any logical or scientific or metabolic um, backing uh, there's uh, really no no rhyme or reason behind some strategies that you see, that you can read about on the internet uh, so uh, so i do want to take the opportunity here now that we had a question on this topic to to discuss this in a bit more detail and at the end of the episode i'll also give you some resources to more episodes that i've done that i highly encourage you to go and listen to as well to really really get a deep understanding uh, of this first i already mentioned the uh, the carb fat switch fallacy and uh, that is something that is commonly misunderstood some may think that uh, that you suddenly once you go across a given intensity you you switch from burning only fats to burning only carbs and vice versa that's not the case or some may think that you you practice a given nutrition protocol like if you eat lchf you only burn fats and once you've adapted to it or if you eat a high carb diet then you only burn carbs and uh, that's the way it is no it's not like that every single endurance athlete at every single intensity burn a mixture oxidize a mixture of fats and carbs and this uh, switch between using fats and carbs is uh, a complete fallacy that uh, there, there is no such switch it is a continuum if we discuss uh, the most important thing i think to discuss here is uh, the different metabolic adaptations that happen to you when you train and when you improve as an endurance athlete and there are three such uh, adaptations and uh, the first one is uh, the increased oxidative capacity of carbohydrate and fats so that means that aerobically you can produce more energy using carbs as fuel and using fats as fuel and increasing that oxidative capacity is of course like massively important for endurance athletes for an 800 meter runner it's not as important because a lot of their energy is going to come from anaerobic capacity or anaerobic uh, metabolism Although they still will use, I don't know off the top of my head, perhaps 50% of their energy will be uh, from oxidative uh, metabolism and 50% from anaerobic glycolytic metabolism. Uh, but uh, for us as endurance athletes, uh, like even in a sprint distance race, uh, close to 100%, let's call it at least 97, 98% of our energy probably is going to come from, uh, from oxidative, uh, oxidative uh, energy. So, so aerobic oxidation of fats and carbohydrates and uh, oxidative capacity is increased with with endurance training uh, simple as that and i don't know the exact proportion but training is probably in the region of like 90 percent of uh, the puzzle if not more when it comes to improving your uh, your oxidative capacity and uh, yet for some reason especially in this day and age with a, lo a lot of fads and, and a lot of uh, uh, misinformation out there uh, it's easy to be misled into putting 90 percent of uh, of your effort and cognitive energy into nutrition which is of much much less importance when it comes to improving this oxidative capacity sure it's it plays a part and, and it is important but uh but remember training is the big 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 rock here and uh, it, it is probably in the region of 90 percent of uh, of how you improve because when you do effective endurance training no matter how you eat like let's consider the marathoners of uh, the 70s frank shorter and bill rogers and the likes they are very famous for uh living on a hamburger and ice cream diet but they were just running a lot and they were training hard they had volume and they had intensity they had an effective endurance training program they had very poor nutrition habits of course ate a lot of junk food but still they were really good marathon runners like exceptional 
marathon runners and even by today's standards as uh, white males their times would really go quite a long way even in today's world and and that is because training is the big 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 uh b- piece that can can move your your aerobic endurance your aerobic uh, oxidation capacity so keep that in mind and oxidative capacity again it consists of utilizing both carbs and fats and both of these aspects are improved in response to endurance training regardless of nutrition you don't need to be lchf to improve your utilization of fats and there is an example a study that i want to read and this is from uh, i'm reading the the chapter on metabolic adaptations to endurance training in inigo muyikas or i read that chapter uh, while researching this this episode uh, from Inigo Muyika's book Endurance Training, which is like an uh, encyclopedia of uh, endurance training. It's a textbook. It's like it's not your your popular science book. It's really a textbook that costs 150 US dollars or something like that. Uh, so, but these are the, the world leading experts, the best in the world at their given fields, have written these different chapters, and Inigo Muyika has uh, edited edited the whole the whole thing. Uh, so this is uh, this is really. Uh, the gold standard when it comes to endurance training and the background and the physiology and this chapter on metabolic adaptations was uh, really great and this uh, uh, study that it mentions is an example of what i just mentioned uh, the study by carter and co-workers from 2001 they had uh, participants complete a 90 minute ride at 60 percent of vo2 peak to obtain baseline measures of substrate metabolism they then completed seven weeks of progressive endurance exercise training before completing two further 90-minute rides, one at the same power output, so the same absolute intensity as the initial test, and the other at 60% of their post-training VO2 peak, so same relative intensity because their VO2 peak improved. And uh, the gl- glucose flux measured as glucose rate of appearance and rate of disappearance in the plasma was reduced post-training at both the same absolute and the same relative intensities, indicating a decrease in carbohydrate oxidation and an increased contribution of, of uh, fats as a substrate. Uh, so, uh, so this is the example, and uh, that shows what I just said. There is no mention at all, and I looked at the study, and they did not control the nutrition of these athletes at all. It was just uh, an endurance exercise training program that they completed over seven weeks, a progressive one, and they increased fat oxidation. So that was the the example I wanted to show you how training really impacts fat oxidation and carb oxidation. And you don't need to worry as much about nutrition. Now, this uh, was already sort of a segue into the second uh, metabolic adaptation that uh, occurs with endurance training. A shift in substrate utilization. Uh, so here we mentioned already that they increased fat oxidation and uh, the relative contribution of fat compared to carbohydrate and the absolute in terms of the in the absolute uh, test at least with the same power output so that's the second adaptation not only do you increase your overall oxidative capacity but you start to shift the aerobic oxidation more towards fat compared to carbs relatively speaking uh, again you do not want to reduce your carb oxidation because they'll make you slower uh, but you want the proportion of fat to carb utilization to move more towards fat uh, because, uh, of course, fat stores are abundant in the body and uh, carb stores are limited. So there is uh, a definitive advantage of that. However, you should be aware that at uh, any race intensity from half Ironman and shorter, you will still be using significantly more carbs than fat. With half Ironman, of course, it depends a bit on, on how fast you are. But if you are a faster athlete, like an intermediate plus or even an intermediate triathlete, then you will be using significantly more carbohydrate than fat. And the shorter the race is, the more uh, carbohydrate will be dominating over fat. Uh, but uh, even at Olympic and the sprint distances, there will be a contribution of fat for sure. So it is worth to to try to absolutely to to get this shift in substrate utilization but again this happens with endurance training as the example just showed regardless of nutrition and actually uh, one other thing that i read in in this chapter uh, is about fasted training and that is something that you mentioned as well and we talked about previously in this episode there is absolutely some evidence that fasted training uh, 
does improve your fat oxidation. But however, there are as many studies that dispute that, that showed no increase in, in relative uh, fat oxidation compared to carb oxidation after implementing fasted training. And there are, zero, there are zero studies that show an improvement in performance from uh, implementing fasted training protocols. Uh, so it is a quite contentious topic. It is a tool in the toolbox. I use it and because I think it just could have some legs. But uh, I am aware that it's uh, something that is going to be like a, a bit of an icing on the cake that may or may not work. And uh, it's probably not going to be harmful if you fuel properly, refuel after the workout and make sure that you do your quality workouts later on. With enough quality, you basically are just in tune with your body and know whether your performances are trending in the right direction. Uh, it's probably not going to be harmful. It could be useful potentially, although the jury is still out on that a little bit. But my recommendation is that you you do your easy fasted workouts a couple of times per week, one to at most one and a half hours as an easy run or ride. And, and that's it. That is enough of a stimulus based on the studies that we, we have that fasted training uh, can Im improve fat oxidation with that amount of stimulus you don't need to go three hours and and i would would not recommend going any longer than that because what you'll do is you'll put yourself at risk of not doing your quality workouts well enough after that because remember even if you're going at an easy intensity you will be burning carbs so you will run your glycogen stores low and if you don't refuel then potentially you're not going to be doing your quality workouts after that fasted ride at a high enough intensity to get the adaptations that you're after so so that's uh, that's my recommendation there and uh, and the, the chapter here concludes if i read verbatim what it says about fasted training here that uh, it should be considered that while metabolic adaptations that favor oxidative energy production and fat oxidation may be down regulated with carbohydrate feeding prior to and during training this may be overcome by the increased capacity for work when exercising in a fuel, fully fueled state. So what that means is that you may get less of an adaptation for increased fat, fat oxidation when you take on carbohydrate during exercise, yes. And again, this is different from your initial question. It doesn't uh, change the, uh, the acute in-the-moment utilization of substrate, but the adaptations, the signaling that you get from after the workout. And... Uh, and there is some evidence, although, as said, uh, it is disputed, uh, that maybe uh, the signaling is stronger for increasing fat oxidation if you don't take on carbohydrate during exercise. But, uh, but the recommendation here is that perhaps the increased capacity for work when exercising in a fully fueled state is more beneficial in the long run. So finally, the third adaptation, metabolic adaptation, is an increase in glycogen storage capacity. So uh, this is uh, pretty simple. You can store more carbohydrate when you train well and when you, your nutrition habits also support it. And I don't know this for sure at all. This is just my theory or speculation, I should say, probably. But like, I have a feeling that if you're always training fasted or like in a low glycogen state, even just constantly thinking actively about reducing carbohydrate in intake in your day-to-day -day life, that it might be more difficult to, to increase your glycogen storage capacity. Uh, why? Where is the signaling, where is the stimulus for the body to increase your glycogen storage capacity if uh, you never take on carbohydrate in the first place? So this is a potential issue with LCHF, but again, this is my theory and not really based on anything I read. I don't know if this is the case. So finally, let's talk a little bit about how intensity impacts these considerations. And, and race intensity in, in particular, because you'll at the end of the day, you'll want to go as fast as possible in a race. That's, that's the goal, right? So again, I'm going to read from uh, the chapter here. And uh, it writes, It is likely that if fat utilization can be increased at higher submaximal intensities, the highly trained endurance athlete who competes at intensities of around 80% of VO2 max will still benefit from the glycogen spearing effect of increased fat oxidation. For those who compete at higher submaximal intensities, fat oxidation can still be achieved during competition range intensities. However, it is likely that once exercise intensity exceeds 80% of VO2 max, 
the real metabolic benefit of endurance training lies in the increased oxidative capacity as a whole and an increased muscle glycogen storage capacity rather than an increased capacity to utilize fat. So uh, that's to sum up, at uh, Olympic distance races, roughly 80% of VO2 max and uh, shorter races, uh, fat oxidation does play a role for sure but the role is uh, much less important than your oxidative capacity as a whole and your glycogen storage capacity. Uh, So uh, strategies specifically to only improve fat oxidation might not be the way to go. So there you go. That was uh, sort of a metabolism 101, and I was uh, jumping back and forth between notes, uh, books, and uh, papers that I had opened in different tabs. So I hope that it was still somewhat coherent and... uh, Definitely send me some follow-up questions that I can answer on future podcasts if you want to. Uh, But I hope this helps and uh, I'm going to link in the episode description here to to a few of the key episodes that I've done on these topics that I would really like you to listen to. And these are episodes 153, The Endurance Diet with Matt Fitzgerald. Episode 40, Race Day Fueling and the Core Diet with Jesse Kropolnicki. Episode 122, Training the Gut, with myself. And episodes 94 and 95, Triathlon Nutrition, Calories, Carbs, Fat and Proteins, Parts 1 and 2, again, with myself. That's it for the question. Uh, One important uh, announcement here is that I just recently finished my intermediate Ironman training plan and launched it on Training Peaks. So as much as I am a big proponent of individual coaching, uh, because nothing can be as valuable as having that one person that really makes everything uh, fit perfectly to you, your individual goals and context and abilities, I realized that not everybody wants to spend the amount of money that it costs you to, to have a good coach. So, uh, so that's why I do think that generic plans have a very important role to play. Uh, but that uh, myself and other training plan creators, we have the responsibility to make sure that we do not get lazy, that we focus not just on the structure and the progression of the plan, but also on ensuring proper execution of the plan uh, from the user. Uh, So that's something that I really focus on in this plan. Uh, I continue on with the theme that I started with my intermediate half-distance plan of doing a lot of coaching videos that are included in the plan that talk about how to execute the plan and uh, really what to think about, what are the key workouts of each week, etc., etc., to help you make the most out of the plan, execute the workouts correctly, remind you of what the most important things are and uh, what you should not worry so much about, and and all these sorts of things that a coach would tell you when, when you have these discussions with a coach. I try to make most of that available in the videos that I've recorded with the, with the plan. The plan itself is 20 weeks long. It has on average 11 hours per week of training uh, and, of course, a coaching video for every week plus one long introductory video that takes you through the plan and general things to consider. And uh, it guides you through setting your individual training zones and individual target paces, powers, heart rates. It's uh, very easy once you do it. It's explained well in the plan. And uh, until the 10th of February, as usual, I have a launch uh, promo period. And that means that you can get it for 30 US dollars rather than the regular price of 75 US dollars on Training Peaks with the coupon code 60. And that's 60, uh, just the two numbers there. And I have three different versions of it one based on uh, run pace, bike power, one based on run pace, bike heart rate, and one based on run power and bike power. So you can choose all of the uh, any one of these, sorry, on Training Peaks. Choose the right one for you. PDF versions of the plan plans will also become available within a month or so, I hope. And if you buy now on Training Peaks, you'll get those PDFs once they are released for no extra cost. I'll link to these plans in the episode description as well, or you can go directly to scientifictriathlon.com. In the menu bar, there is a training plans item. Click through to Intermediate Ironman and it will take you uh, to my training plans page. It will actually take you to my to the power and pace version of the plan. But you can go to offer info. Actually, just go to the episode description and click through to the right version immediately. That's way easier than what I was just going to describe uh, describe through the website. 
All right. Uh, I hope I think that's it for this episode. Big thanks to our sponsors, Hit Science. They will help you understand how to use high intensity interval training as a coach, as a scientist, or as, as an athlete. Today is the last day to enroll. It's the 31st of January. So be sure to enroll now. There's a money back guarantee if you don't find value in it. Uh, so it's a risk free investment. And remember, last day of enrollment is today, not tomorrow. And big thanks to Retool. Go to retool.com forward slash TTS. That's R E T U L dot com forward slash TTS to learn more about the Retool bike fitting process and to find a Retool bike fitter near you. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>